We're in Romans chapter 9. I'm not sure if that's on. Is that too much? All right, we're in, we're in Romans chapter 9 this morning, which is, in my opinion, the hardest chapter in the entire Bible to understand. It's the hardest chapter to talk about, and it's one that I'd prefer to skip over, but I don't uh, believe in doing that, and we're going through the book of Romans. Um, so I want to begin by trying to tackle this difficult chapter by saying, first of all, I don't claim to, to have all the answers, and I don't pretend to be right about everything. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm glad to see many of you turning in your Bibles. I certainly invite you to follow along with me, and we're going to look at some very difficult truths, truths that have divided churches and split associations and fellowships and, and uh, universities and, and things like that for years and years and years. So very difficult to talk today about the sovereignty of God. Here's what Dr. Warren Wearsby said about the sovereignty of God. He said, try to explain it and you may lose your mind. Try to explain it away and you may lose your soul. Uh, it's something that is difficult to grasp and you might say, you know what, I, I don't, I'll never figure it out. I just, I'm not even going to try, but it's, it's part of who God is. It's part of his word. And so we're going to look at it this morning. And I've been praying all week uh, that God would give us understanding hearts. And as we go through this morning, we'll see some things that maybe we don't agree with. Maybe you won't agree with me, and, and that's fine. But I've just been praying that God's Holy Spirit would move among us today and open our eyes to his truth. But I want to ask you the question that's on the screen, the title of the message, and that simply, is God fair? Is he fair? Now, as it relates to salvation, I don't know that I want God to be fair. You know what I mean? I, I, if God is fair and gives me what I deserve, I'm not so sure I want a fair God, because what do I deserve? I've spent my whole life choosing to act in disobedience against him. Now, now I'm a Christian. I don't call myself a sinner. The Bible says I'm a saint, but I do things wrong all the time. If God is fair and gives me what I deserve, then I, I'm facing hell. He would have to say, depart from me, because you are a, a worker of iniquity. I don't want him to be fair. I want God to be merciful and gracious. So as it relates to salvation, no, God is not fair. He does not give me what I deserve. And if you're a Christian, you ought to be able to echo that and say, that's right, I'm glad he's not fair because I'm a sinner and I deserve hell. I've sinned and, and I should never be allowed into a place like heaven. I should never be allowed before the throne of God. But because he's gracious and merciful, I can make it to heaven. But is he fair in the way he makes us go through life sometimes? Is he fair when we have to go through hardships? Is he fair when people who are young get sick? Is he fair when good workers lose their jobs? Is he fair when hearts get broken? Is he fair when we become victims? Is he fair when any number of bad things happen to us? And so some can look at God and just conclude, you know what, he's just not fair. But I want to tell you two things I have found out to be true about God over the years. First of all, God does not need my permission to do anything that he desires to do. He doesn't need my permission. You know, there's, there's politicians and public figures and even firms that will hire people to do market research and they'll do test cases and they'll, they'll spend lots of money and lots of time before they make a decision or say anything and see, how's this polling with the people? If we do it like this, what are they going to say? Is this going to hurt us? Will this be good PR for us? God doesn't do anything like that. God has never once asked our permission before doing anything. Now, we might not like what he does, but he doesn't owe us an explanation. He doesn't first have to get a majority of the vote, or he doesn't first have to get us all to agree before he does something. Not only does he not need our permission, but this might even sound kind of harsh, but he doesn't even ask us to like it. God might do things in your life and mine that we don't even like, and God has never once asked us to like it. Have you been through tragedy? Of course you have. God didn't ask you to like it. He didn't ask you to agree to it beforehand. But I do believe in a sovereign God that sits on a throne in heaven. And I believe that absolutely nothing ever happens in the universe that he did not either author it or allow it. Maybe it was his idea and he made something happen or else, like we see in the life of Job, it wasn't God's idea to put Job through the fire, was it? Now, now, God said, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Look how good he is. And Satan is the one that said, if you give me permission to make him sick, to make his family turn against him, if you give me permission to even kill his children, God, if you give me permission to do these things, I bet Job will curse you to your face. And God gave him permission. 
nothing bad happened to Job that God did not allow. Satan had to gain God's permission before he could persecute Job. And I believe that there is not a bad thing to ever happen in your life that God didn't allow it to happen. So we might look at some of these things and think, well, God's unfair. It's just not right. If I were God, I wouldn't have done that. Well, that's fine, but you're not God, and I'm not God. There's one who is, and we have to trust him. When things don't make sense, when we look in, at God and just say, God, how in the world could you let that happen? God, I trusted you. I served you. I, I've spent 50 years going to church and being a good Christian, doing everything you said, and this is how you pay me back, God? We have to trust him. We have to believe that he's good, believe that he's in control. And the things that we don't understand, we have to go back to Romans 8, 28, which we saw a few weeks ago. For those of us that love God, all these things are working together for some kind of greater good. I don't understand it right now, but God, I trust you. I don't like it, God. My heart is broken. I'm angry, God, but I trust you. As Christians, we have to come to the place where we say, God, we trust you even when we don't like what he's doing. And you know what? God is a big God, and he's tough, and he has thick skin, and he can handle our complaints. He can handle our questions. Because eventually Job had enough, and he finally said, God, please tell me why. God, I don't understand this. God, I've been a good person. God didn't zap Job with lightning for daring to question his authority. God allowed Job to say whatever he wanted, to ask whatever he wanted. And we can likewise pour our hearts out to God as well. He's a good God. I believe it. Although I do believe there's things in my life that I will never understand. Things that God has allowed to happen that I will never get. Maybe one day in heaven we'll say, oh, that's why. And maybe not. But God is infinite. He's wise. His ways are so much higher than ours. As, ho- as high as the heavens are above the earth, the Bible says, so much higher are his thoughts and his plans than ours. Have you ever tried to write the script to your own life? I've tried that several times. I eventually quit writing the script because I found out life is much easier when I let God write it and I just try to follow it. He's better at it. He knows the future. He knows what's going on when we don't understand. Romans 9 is a uh, a tough chapter, but it shows that God is sovereign. And sometimes God steps in and he saves the day. And sometimes God extends mercy to those who do not deserve it. But other times God does things that we look at and we say, well, God, that's just not fair. In Romans 9, we're going to see some difficult things, and we'll try to move through them quickly. But in Romans 9, we're going to see phrases like, Jacob, have I loved, but Esau, have I hated? Before he was born, before he did good or evil, I hated Esau. We're going to see about Pharaoh in the days of the Exodus, where God says, Paul says of God, did he not raise Pharaoh up just to destroy him, just to show God's wrath? Therefore, he shows mercy on who he'll show mercy, and he hardens the ones that will harden. Now, stick with me this morning. You say, but boy, that sounds terrible. If you're in Romans chapter 9, Paul's going to show us three groups of Old Testament people to make his case for the sovereignty of God. He begins, if you take notes, number one, with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac. Look at verse 6. Paul says, Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all his children. Here's his point. He says, here's a quote from the Old Testament. In Isaac shall your seed be called. In verse 9, he says, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. There is a, a truth about our salvation we could look at here. Basically saying it doesn't matter who your parents are. For these old, old uh, Jews here, it doesn't matter if they're sons of Abraham. You don't get saved because of who your parents are. But the truth that Paul's trying to make here is that God looked at the sons of Abraham and he picked one. He picked Isaac. How many children did Abraham have? He had at least eight. The Bible speaks of Isaac as being that son of promise, but before Isaac was born, Abraham had a son, Ishmael, with Hagar. And then after Sarah died, who had Isaac, after she died, Abraham married again and had six more sons. So Abraham had eight sons, but it was in Isaac, is what Paul says. In Isaac shall your seed be called, through the child of Sarah, not the child of Hagar, and and not the child of Abraham's wife after Sarah died, but only through Isaac. What he's saying here is that God sovereignly chose Isaac to carry on 
the covenant. Out of all the people in the world, God chose Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was a super guy? No, as far as we know. God plucked Abraham out of a pagan land. Not that Abraham knew anything about God, but God picked him and made a covenant with him. And he said, your descendants from your offspring, I will bring, long story short, but I'll bring Jesus into the world through one of your descendants. He had eight sons. They couldn't all eight be the ones to bring Jesus into the world, right? God picked one. He picked Isaac, sovereignly. Not because Isaac was a really good person. It was chosen before Isaac was born. So the point Paul is making is that God just picked Isaac. Now, some will look at this verse and say that God played eeny, meeny, miny, mo and, and picked Isaac, and, and the other seven had no chance of ever being saved. You ever play eeny, meeny, miny, mo? Am I the only one? Is that a Florida thing? I remember the first time, okay, good. I remember the first time I was involved in a game of eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I was in preschool, and one of my friends brought this new toy, and we all wanted to play with it. And so he was going to let us take turns. And so we were standing in a circle, and, and he began to, to do, I had never heard this before in my life, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by his toe. And, and I'm like three or four years old here in preschool, and I'm like, how did a tiger get introduced into this thing? We're going to grab a tiger? And then he says, my mama said to pick the very best one, and guess who was not it? I was the first one his mom said not to pick. I was so confused. So I didn't think his mom even knew me. I don't know his mom. And what have I ever done to her to not be able to be picked? I, see, I didn't know what was going on at the time. I later learned eeny, meeny, miny, mo is legally binding among kids. That's how you solve any kind of dispute. But some people believe that God from heaven, maybe before we were born, that God plays this sovereign game of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, And that's how he picks who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And maybe it's my father instead of my mother, but maybe Jesus says, my father said to pick the very best one. And you can go to heaven, you can go to heaven, and none of the rest of you. And people believe, based on this passage, that God picked Isaac, that they're saying that God picked Isaac to be saved. God picked Isaac to salvation, and these other seven never had a chance. Well, that's, that's not true at all. That's not what this passage is saying. God picked Isaac to carry on the covenant. But remember Ishmael and his mother Hagar when they left? It's okay. She doesn't believe in God's sovereignty. That's all right. But remember, remember the, that the Lord appears to Hagar and Ishmael and, and says that, that God's going to take care of you. You're still going to be a mighty nation. And, and so she even says that he is the God who sees me. And as far as we know, that Hagar and Ishmael, at least in that moment, they believed in God. Now, Ishmael's descendants is another story, but it wasn't that God picked Isaac and then doomed Ishmael to go to hell. God appeared to Ishmael and his mother and said, you're not going to die of starvation out here in this desert. I'm going to take care of you. Your son is still going to have this great nation come from. As far as we know, God took care of Ishmael. And these other six sons that Abraham had later, we have no reason to believe anything other than Abraham raised them to believe in the same God he did and the same God he taught Isaac about. As far as we know, all eight of the sons of Abraham could be in heaven today. This passage that God picked Isaac does not mean he picked Isaac for salvation and doomed the other seven to condemnation. It means he picked Isaac to carry on the covenant. That, the, that Jesus will come into the world from Abraham and then Isaac. This is not a passage that shows God playing eeny, meeny, miny, mo with anyone's salvation, although many teach that from this passage today. Paul mentions Abraham and Isaac, and then he continues, number two, by going to Jacob and Esau. This is where it begins to get a little bit trickier. But in verse 10, Paul continues his, his point. He says, not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or any evil, but that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calls. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Another passage that's used by many people to teach that before these people were ever born, God says, I'm going to love Jacob. The blood of Jesus shed on the cross will be enough to save Jacob, but not Esau. Esau has done nothing wrong yet. He's not been born yet, but he never has a chance. 
I allowed his mother to conceive and bear him and bring him into the world, but I'm giving him no chance whatsoever to be saved because I hate that guy. Even though he's never done anything, he's not even born yet, but I hate him. And people use this passage to teach, first of all, that God hates people, that he hates people without them doing anything, and that God actually creates people that never have a chance to be saved. Again, I don't believe that. I believe we have to balance God's sovereignty with the responsible choices that Jacob and Esau had to make for themselves. I'll show you what I mean. But, but here's what I believe this passage is saying. Just as God chose Abraham and then chose Isaac, so next he also chose Jacob. Both Jacob and Esau could not both bring Jesus into the world. It could only be through one of the sons. And so God, before they were born, he chose Jacob. In a culture where the firstborn was always the favored, God said the elder will serve the younger. Esau was the elder. God said this is going to be backwards to a lot of people, but Jacob, and we've been going through Genesis on Sunday nights, but Jacob is going to be the one to carry on the covenant, not through Esau. Does this mean that Esau never had any chance to be saved? He had every chance to be saved. We saw Esau as we went through Genesis on Sunday night, how, how Esau and Jacob each had a series of choices to make. Sometimes they made right choices, sometimes they made wrong choices. Jacob was by no means perfect. But at the end of the day, Jacob trusted in God. Esau, we don't know that he ever made a decision to trust in God, but it was not from a lack of him having chances to do that. Now this passage says the elder will serve the younger. We saw that in Genesis. That was not a knock at Esau. That's just God saying, I can only pick one, so I'm picking Jacob. Jacob is going to be the one that's going to bring Jesus into the world. What does it mean, though, Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated? Now, we went through this on Sunday night in Genesis. Did we read that verse? No, that verse does not appear in Genesis. God did not say that before the twins were born. A thousand years later, the prophet Obadiah would say those words, that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Those words appear in Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, if you want to go and read it at a later time. But God's not speaking about Jacob and Esau because they've been dead for a thousand years. He's speaking about the descendants of Jacob and Esau. Who are the descendants of Jacob? That's the nation of Israel. We know that God loved Israel. We know they were his chosen people. Who are the descendants of Esau? Those are the Edomites. They were the enemies of Israel throughout the Old Testament. And so you might say, well, isn't that even worse? Okay, so I'm struggling with God hating Esau. Now you're telling me God hates all of Esau's descendants? That's much worse, isn't it? Maybe you're wondering, does God hate me? Does God hate my unsaved relatives? Well, I can answer that by telling you no. God doesn't hate you. He didn't hate Esau, didn't hate Esau's descendants, and he doesn't hate anybody because he's a God of love. That We just sang about that amazing love, didn't we? In English, love and hate are strong words, aren't they? In fact, we even teach our kids at a young age, you don't say hate, that's not nice, that's a bad word, you don't hate anybody. We teach them not to use that word, it's strong. If we were to draw a chart, we would put love on one side, and then like, and then maybe like indifferent, and then dislike over here, and then all the way over here would be hate. And we have love and hate in English on opposite ends of a spectrum. That's not the way it worked in these ancient biblical languages. They were not strong words, they were comparative words. We talked about how, uh, looking back in the Old Testament, about how, uh, how Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Isaac. That doesn't mean that they hated the other one. It means that they had a preference. Let's talk about ice cream for a second, because I can see, I know we're dealing with a lot of tough stuff right now. So let, let's think about ice cream, because we're going to have ice cream social tonight. I love ice cream, and I can say that emphatically. Now, favorite flavors, I'd have to put chocolate chip cookie dough at the top of the list, and I'd put cookies and cream or Oreo just right there with it. I love that stuff. Now, something, something kind of plain like chocolate, vanilla, not my favorite. If I could go to a buffet and pick any kind of ice cream I want, that would not be what I would pick. But if it wasn't a buffet and the only kind of ice cream available was a bowl of chocolate, I will gladly eat the entire bowl of chocolate ice cream. So in English... I can say, I love chocolate chip cookie dough. And chocolate, it's not too bad. I can eat some chocolate ice cream. But in these ancient biblical languages, you would say, chocolate chip cookie dough have I loved, but chocolate have I hated. 
And so comparatively, compared to cookie dough, I hate chocolate ice cream. Well, you might be shocked then to see me eating a bowl of chocolate ice cream. Hey, I thought you hated that. In English, I don't hate it. In English, it's, it's not too bad. But in Hebrew and in Greek, in these ancient languages, comparatively, compared to my love for the chocolate chip cookie dough, I would say I hate chocolate. That's why Jesus said if no one hates his mother and father and follows after me, he's not worthy of me. He's not telling you to hate your parents, but comparatively, if you love them more than you love Jesus, he's saying you're not worthy. These are comparative words. They, they didn't use a lot of the adverbs and adjectives like we use today. They would repeat words to show strong feeling. That's why the Bible says that the Lord is holy, holy, holy. Instead of saying really, really, really holy, they just repeat the word over and over. So love and hate are not strong biblical words. So Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated? Or the Israelites have I loved and the Edomites have I hated? It's not our word for hate. We know that the Israelites were God's chosen people. He, he picked them to bring Jesus into the world. He told Abraham, through you all the world will be blessed. Why? Because of Jesus. We are blessed today because Abraham eventually brought Jesus into the world. And so God preferred Israel for this covenant, for this task, for the responsibility of bringing in the Messiah and showing us the relationship of him being the bride and, or him being the groom and us being the bride, showing us what that love really looks like. And he preferred less the Edomites, who did not worship him, did not believe in him, did not have a covenant with him, but spent their lives practicing idolatry. So God preferred, he loved Jacob, and e Jacob more than Esau. This verse does not teach that before anyone was born, God hated them. That based on their works or based on their lack of works, that God hated them and they had no hope of salvation. Despite the fact that many will say that today. The final thing that, the final group that Paul points to. You have Abraham and Isaac, you have Jacob and Esau, finally you have Moses and Pharaoh. Beginning in verse or look in verse 14. He says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Because of what we just said, is God unfair? Is he unrighteous? And he answers it the way he does throughout Romans. God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that wills or him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. Meaning we can't earn our salvation, but we're thankful God's merciful. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose, I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom you have mercy, and on whom he will, he hardens. Another tough portion of scripture here that we want to make sure we don't run to an extreme on either side. He tells Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. That was said after the golden calf incident in Exodus chapter 32. Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. The people are worshiping a golden calf. And Moses, through God, executes judgment on him. 3,000 people lost their lives that day. Now, biblically, we could make the case that every single person could have died that day. Every single person had violated this law. You shall make no graven image. You shall have no other God before me. Why only 3,000? Because God told Moses, I'll show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. When every last one of them could have been killed, God spared the majority. And so some may look at that and say, well, how's that fair? How, how did he pick this person or not pick? It's not for us to decide how it's fair or not. What's fair is every last one of them dying. What's merciful is God in his sovereignty choosing to rescue some from the judgment that they deserve. It is not unfair of God, it is not unrighteous of God for him to rescue someone off of death row. It's merciful. Because if I died in my sins and go to hell, I'm getting what I deserve. It's only merciful of God. No one in hell can ever shake their fist at God and say, how is this fair, God? For them getting the very judgment that they invited into their lives, for rejecting the very God that died to make their salvation possible. There's no unrighteousness in God. He's not unfair. He's abounding in mercy. Now, in this case, how did he choose to show mercy to some? We don't know. He just told Moses, it's my call, Moses. It's not yours. 
If I want to show mercy, Moses, I'll show mercy. If I want to let them die in the sin that they committed, Moses, I'll let them do that. And so we see, though, that that is a a thing that we should just trust God in his mercy, even though I, I can't wrap my mind around that sometimes. That's an act of mercy, not anything that's unrighteous. But what, what of Pharaoh? For this cause I raised Pharaoh up, that I may show my power in him. Think about Pharaoh. Remember the story of the ten plagues? And God says, this guy right here, I raised him up so I could work these plagues against him. So my power can be known throughout all the earth. So Israel can trust me. So the Egyptians can fear me. So that thousands of years later, people can read in their Bible and know what a powerful God I am. I raised Pharaoh up for this purpose. And so some look at this passage and say, Pharaoh was created with no chance to ever be saved. God made Pharaoh, put him there, made him be an evil guy just so God could wipe him out. How is that fair to Pharaoh? Well, again, that's not what I believe this passage is saying. The phrase raised up does not mean created like a lot of people might think it means. Raised up means that God allowed Pharaoh to rise to power. Pharaoh was a bad guy. Pharaoh was always a bad guy. God didn't make him a bad guy. But God allowed him to become a powerful ruler. See, all of our rulers, the Bible says, are, are appointed by God. Now, sometimes, like King Saul, the people rebel against what God wants, and he gives them the people that they asked for, whether at the ballot box or whether through their demands. But God raised up Pharaoh. I mean, God allowed this bad guy to become a ruler so that when God executed judgment, it would be a worldwide event. God could have brought judgment against Pharaoh with Pharaoh being a nobody in his own house, and we wouldn't know the story of it. So instead of God bringing judgment against him privately, God raised him up to a public position so that everybody would know about it. That's a lot different than saying God created him just to destroy him. No, God took someone who was already evil and allowed him to become a powerful person so God could show he was more powerful than Pharaoh. I hope you understand the difference. But it says that God hardened his heart. Well, How's that fair? If God hardened his heart, how could he be saved? Well, in Exodus chapter 8, we see three times that Pharaoh hardened his own heart long before God ever did. After the first plague, Pharaoh hardened his heart. After the second plague, Pharaoh hardened his heart. After the third plague, Pharaoh hardened his heart. After the fourth plague, God hardened his heart. So we can say, how's that fair? Well, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God could have, after one plague, or Pharaoh could have, after one plague, Pharaoh could have said, all right, fine, I'm going to let his people go, take him, Moses, get out of here, and they'd have been gone. God would have still accomplished his goal. God would have shown he was more powerful than Pharaoh. The whole world would have feared God, and God's plan would have been carried out. If Pharaoh would have softened his heart, let them go, and he could have even worshipped God himself, and God's plan would have been carried out. This does not mean that God's plan from the beginning was to doom Pharaoh to hell without him ever having a chance to do anything about it. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. And I think one of the scariest things then is that you may be sitting here right now this morning and you harden your heart and you harden your heart and you harden your heart and you cannot die one day and shake your fist at God and say, how could you send me to a place like this? If that's where you are today, Soften your heart. Don't make the mistake that Pharaoh did. He had every chance when confronted by Moses and Aaron to soften his heart and to bow his knee in submission before God. The fact that he rejected and rejected and rejected is his fault. And it's certainly not anything that we can accuse God of doing wrong. Look in verse 20. Because we might get tempted to say that God is not fair and he's not right. Verse 20 says, Paul says, No, O man, who are you? To reply against God, shall the thing formed say to that who formed it, why have you made me thus? What are you doing? Why have you done it this way? Verse 22, what if God, willing to show his own wrath and make his power known, endured with much long-suffering or patience those vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? 
So does God make these vessels fitted for destruction? Does God create some people just to show off his wrath like Pharaoh? Again, it's tough in English, but in Greek, fitted for destruction is a passive tense verb that means they became that way and God had nothing to do with it. These vessels fitted for destruction are the people like Pharaoh who made their own choices, that made their bed and had to lay in it, that rejected God despite his mercy. God didn't create them as vessels for destruction from the beginning, but God gave them a free will, and he allowed them to choose that path for themselves. Look, Romans 9 is a difficult chapter. I believe it's an important chapter because we have to understand that God is absolutely in control. There's two groups of people. There's some that look at Romans 9 and they form this hardcore theology that says, God plays eeny, meeny, miny, mo. God picks some to be saved and dooms others. God makes everyone do what they do and you're like programmed robots and you have no say in the matter. And on the other side, there's those that run so far to the other side to say, no, 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 we've got free will. And they go so far as to make it like God is up in heaven right now watching us. And we'll go into the invitation and God's up there thinking, boy, I hope somebody gets saved today. Boy, I, I hope somebody's going to make that choice to worship me today. As if God has no say and no knowledge of what's going on. Both of those are false, and the truth is found in the middle. Throughout Scripture, we see God's sovereignty always balanced with you and me and the people in the Bible choosing for themselves what they will do. As Joshua said, choose this day who you will serve. And we see phrases throughout Scripture like, whoever believes, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. As Jesus told Nicodemus that if you believe you will have eternal life. As Jesus told his disciples that all who come to me I will in no wise cast out. He told the Father all that have come to me I have not lost. We see man having a responsibility to believe and to call on and to come to him, to choose him. So while God is certainly in control we have this balancing act of us having a say in the matter, of us having a choice. I don't believe that God plays eeny, meeny, miny, mo with our salvation, but neither do I believe that God has ever forced anyone to be saved against their will. I believe that God in His sovereignty has brought everyone to a place where they can choose for themselves to be saved. And He asks you to make the choice. He asks you to choose Him above yourself, above whatever other religion, above your friends or family, above anything you'd rather hold on to than him. He's asking you to make that choice. So maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, well, what if God's hardened my heart? Or what if I've hardened my heart? Is it too late for me? Is there any hope for me? Here's the good news. That in God's sovereignty, he brought you right here, right now, to hear the message that you can be saved. That if your heart has been hardened, he can soften it. If you will call out to him still, he can save you. Because I believe that as long as there's breath in your body, there's a chance for you to be saved. And God would not have brought you here today if you're unsavable. He would not have you sitting here right now to hear the message of what his son did for you on the cross. He could have given up on you a long time ago, but you're here. And it's not by accident. He's brought you here but the choice is yours. We all have a choice in this matter. Are you going to bow your knee to Christ or not? Are you going to call him Lord or not? Maybe you've lived your life up to this point apart from him. And he wants you to be saved. He wants you to trust in him. He wants you to believe in him. And it's as simple as you saying, yes, Lord, I believe in you. I trust in you. Would you forgive me for my sins? God, would you save me? And he'll do that. But if you walk out of here saying, no, 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 I can't do that, not today. That means I'm going to have to give up my lifestyle. That means I'm going to have to make some changes. I'm not ready to do that yet. And you walk out of here hardening your heart. You have no way of knowing that it could be like Pharaoh, that final time when he hardened his heart. And the next time, God hardened it. He'll have mercy on you today if you call on him as your Lord and Savior. You have no way of knowing if you have another chance after this one. This might be it. 
Today might be your last chance to be saved. So let, like the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Let that be you, you unconverted person. Let today be the day you trust in him. I'm going to ask you to stand, please, with your heads bowed wherever you are, and not think about anything else except this question. Is he the Lord of my life? Because we can get so wrapped up saying, yeah, you know, I tried that church thing, but God's just not fair. If he's really loving, there wouldn't be all this suffering in the world. If God's really good, you know what, forget all that stuff for a minute. He's bigger than us, he's better than us, he's smarter than us. Forget all the hard questions and just ask yourself this. If I died today, would I go to heaven or hell? You might say, I don't like what God is doing. Okay, fine. If you can find a better offer, I'll listen. But he's the only God, the only one that offers us salvation. We are all headed for hell as we are, and in his mercy he'll reach down and he'll grab you if you call on his name. If you've never been saved today, don't harden your heart. Don't leave here like Pharaoh who doomed himself after he gave up on God. If you know you're not right with God, you know that you died, you know that hell would be your home. Get that right today. God has brought you here, and I'm thankful that he has make it right. Lord, I pray right now for everyone in this room that if there's any that have never given their lives to you, don't let them harden their heart today. God, soften their heart. Please show mercy on them. I'm thankful that you are a God of love, not hate, that you have made the way possible for us to go to heaven, have our sins forgiven, that you crucified Jesus instead of us, that you punished him instead of us if we choose that. So, Lord, I pray right now, maybe there's someone that knows in their heart they need to get right with you. Let them do it. Right now, let them step out from where they are and come down here. Or let them pray where they stand and say, God, save me. Lord, I pray that great things would happen now during this, these next few minutes. Maybe there's a Christian that's just been struggling. God, how could you do that? God, why would you do that? Let them trust in you. Let them learn to say, God, I trust you. I believe in you. I don't get it. I don't like it. I wish you didn't. But, God, I trust you. And life is so much better lived that way. So Lord, I pray in these next few minutes you'd help us to do what we need to do. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come this morning for prayer to get something right in your life, don't delay. Come on now.